Stories bigger than Texas, the Alamo podcast. The Battle of the Alamo lasted roughly 90 minutes, but the weapons that forged a revolution crossed oceans, changed sides, and in some cases became as mythical as the fighters who manned them. Today, we reveal where many of the cannons used in the Texas Revolution came from, dispel the myths behind the Battle of the Alamo's most famous cannons, and show you the painstaking efforts to ensure these now silent cannons are not forgotten. I'm your host, Emily Balkum. We're joined by Colby Lanham, senior historian and researcher. Colby, we're so excited to have you on the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Now, you served in the military before coming to the Alamo, so of course, thank you for your service. What branch did you serve in, and how did you come to work at the Alamo? I was uh, in the United States Air Force, and I went in in 2006, and I did my six years and got out in 2012. And when I got out, I was about midway point of my anthropology degree. And I, since I was a mechanic in the military, I thought, well, that's the path I need to continue until I finish my degree. And I had a job lined up in Converse to work in the oil field and came downtown to celebrate that job, and I was going to tell them I was going to take the job. And we stopped by the Alamo, and I went through, and I thought, man, that's really cool. And and that night, I was reading a book from the gift shop about 2 a.m., and I thought, man, what am I doing? I, I, I'm going to school to be an anthropologist. I need to do that and, and not do the mechanic side of things. And so I wrote them an email about 2 a.m., them being the Alamo, and um, they wrote me back and said, yeah, you can have a job. So I turned down the other one in Converse. Burning and, the midnight oil with yeah. that book, late and, night email, that visit changed your life. That's it. Yeah, it changed everything for me. And um, I started on as a part-time employee, and I've been here ever since, about 11 years. And along the way, you earned a master's degree. You wrote your thesis on the very topic we're talking about today, weapons of the Texas Revolution. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that was a, that's been a passion of mine since I started working here. I find the artillery and weaponry really fascinating. And some people are fascinated by weapons. Others, they like to focus on other aspects of history. But what's interesting about your thesis is you are framing artillery as a way to better understand the motivations of both sides of the Texas Revolution. Yeah, you know, we, we have a, a big site history and a big story to tell at the Alamo. Um, but artillery has been there since the beginning. Uh, there's always been a need for protection on the Texian frontier in the American Southwest, and artillery is one way they did it. Um, but because artillery was there always, that means that it travels along with the story as it progresses. And so it's important when we're talking about it, we can capture some of the audience that may not care about weaponry, but you could tie it into the mission system and how they used it to protect the front gate and, uh, of course, the text revolution and on and on. That list is, is really cool. And yeah, it's just something I really find fascinating. And so when we think of early Texas, we really need to think in the context of Spain, trying to protect its interests in the new world. And a big way to do that was cannons. So much of our conversation today will focus on cannons. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the world uh, back then was getting uh, bigger and bigger because of exploration. And Spain had a, a lot at stake here in the New World. And the artillery was one way to try to maintain control. You've uncovered that some cannons used in Texas during the revolution actually came from Sweden. And that's a connection to the Alamo a lot of people may not know about. Yeah, when people think about Sweden, they usually think Ikea and meatballs. But... Um, in actuality, you know, uh, Sweden was an, is, is still an iron-rich nation, always has been, and they produced some of the finest pieces of artillery in human history uh, under King Adolphus III. And, and these cannons from Sweden, they're much more nimble. You can move them around more easily. Yeah, uh, he, he, being King uh, Gustav Adolphus III, invented what we call flying artillery, that you could quickly move along the battlefield, not these giant, cumbersome, uh, monstrous sized cannons and since you could move them quickly you could outflank your opponent some of his tactics are still taught at West Point today Wow meantime the Spanish they're trying to protect their interests they're training Mexican soldiers and they are consolidating cannons right here in San Antonio yeah that's exactly right so um, it's a little bit different in the other Mexican states but Texas the northernmost um, province they uh, is vast is very large and so they had some key economic centers in Bihar, or San Antonio today, was one of those places where artillery just naturally gravitated to. So by 1821, the Mexican Revolution is taking place. And because Mexico had been part of Spain for so many years, the military retains the traditions and the training and even inherits some of the artillery. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, Mexico is going to pick up right where the Spanish left off, and it's going to be a pretty seamless transition for them. And the artillery is a big part of that. So let's move into the Texas Revolution. At a certain point, the political realities in Mexico 
force people living in Texas to make some tough choices. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's important to know if you're a visitor at the Alamo or even if you're just looking at the Alamo story, it was not clear cut and dry. Uh, there are people who are caught in the middle, people who are forced to make decisions against their own morals. Um, and uh, there are very tough decisions that people found themselves on both sides of the story. And um, it wasn't always by choice. And it not really good versus evil as it's sometimes framed. Yeah, it's not. What you have is uh, normal individuals put in a very precarious or extraordinary circumstance. And then they, in some cases, do something very extraordinary. And so um, they're just normal, normal people like us. And I think it's important to normalize that. They did something extraordinary, but they're just a normal human being. And uh, I think that makes the story uh, better to understand for the modern visitor or the person reading about our story. Was there a big difference between the weapons Texans were using and the weapons used by the Mexican army? The biggest difference would be in the small arms or the, the rifles and the muskets. Uh, both sides are using rifles and muskets, but there's uh, more rifles on the Texian side. And it's because they're coming from the, uh, the backwood areas of Kentucky and Pennsylvania uh, and Tennessee, and they're using those rifles to hunt game. And eventually, when the revolution breaks out, those weapons go from being something used in civilian use to being used in a revolution. There's the famous cannon that came from the town of Gonzales, the come and take it cannon. How was it used and what happened to it? So the come and take it cannon, uh, when you visit Gonzales today, they have a very small cannon uh, on a uh, carriage. That gun um, is not the gun that the Mexican government is hunting. Whenever uh, the hostilities are boiling over and we, the Mexican government is very aware that something's going to happen, this revolution that's boiling over in lower Mexico is going to eventually spread to Texas, they want to try to consolidate all the guns into one spot. Now, one spot is the Alamo. And about 100 uh, men uh, leave San Antonio, Mexican soldiers trying to retrieve the gun, and they're unsuccessful. And that's where you get the come and take it flag. Uh, the gun they're after was not the small one in the museum today. It was a very large bronze six-pounder that weighed about 800 pounds. And what happened to that one? That gun was eventually um, taken to San Antonio. We think it may have been used at the Battle of Concepcion, which is the predecessor to the Battle of Bejar. It was probably used in the Battle of Bejar and then eventually ends up at the Alamo. The front line then moves to what's now modern-day San Antonio. At that point, there are about 60 cannons between the Texan and Mexican armies but they weren't all in good condition. Yeah, um, we don't know the exact number. It could be a little bit lower than that. It could be uh, right around that number. Um, the problem was always the same from Spain to Mexico to uh, Texas, is that there's not a lot of wood in this area and there's not a lot of big trees to make cannon carriages. Spain puts out several requests for carpenters in the United States to come down to New, uh, to Texas, to New Spain, and make carriages. And it's just, it's a bit of a, a bit of a, uh, supply nightmare, if you will. The cannons are falling apart, or the carriages, rather, are falling apart, and it's hard to keep up the maintenance on them. And, and you've wrote, written in your research that the carriages on the journey, the trek around Texas and Mexico, just got beat up. Yeah, there, there are no roads. It's not like you hop on uh, 35 and, and come on in. It's, it's a very rough um, road, if there's one at all, and the rocks and everything else could really mess the wheels up, not to mention extreme heat on wood is never good or cold or, or weather um, if it's raining or whatever. But um, they, they say about 10 years per, per carriage if you're doing everything you possibly can to save it. It's probably a lot less here in Texas. Especially if you're in the middle of a revolution. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So some of the carriages are actually makeshift carriages. Uh, they're using like cotton wagon axles for the six pounder. And they may even have been using kind of a, like a Lazy Susan style for some of the guns. They call it a pivot. A pivot carriage or a um, kind of a turntable carriage, if you will. So there's some of that going on, a lot of ingenuity. Well, right now we're in the fall, winter of 1835, and the people on both sides are really not in tip-top shape either. No, they're not. I mean, typically armies during this period, especially professional armies like the Mexican army, uh, would be uh, fording up for the winter. You know, you're not in the cold season, you're not going out on campaign. You'll get nice, nice and fat and happy, as I always say. And then in the summertime, you'll go out. And that's where, you, um, where you'll uh, go wage war on your enemy or whoever it may be. And the Texans kind of knew that because when they capture Behar, they don't think the Mexican army is coming back until the springtime. And so that's why we're caught off guard or Texans are caught off guard when the Mexican army arrives in February of 1836. And that's where our timeline moves, February 1836. Texans had the 18-pounder cannon, which you can see at the Alamo today, a recreation of it. And there's a bit of a myth behind it that it was the largest cannon west of the Mississippi. Was that true? 
Yeah, so uh, it depends how you measure large. Um, it was shorter than the 16 pounder that was here and it's lighter than the 16 pounder that was here, but it has a bigger bore. And so the bore, meaning the hole that would uh, have the cannonball exit out of is much larger, the cannonball is larger. So if you're talking about caliber size, yes, the 18 pounder is the largest. If you're talking about weight and length or size, it's a 16 pounder. So um, that myth kind of just grows and grows and it's primarily because of Colonel Travis and his use of that gun on February 23rd. Do we know where the other cannons at the Alamo were positioned? We do not know exactly where each uh, size of gun is. We do have a map that shows where the guns were, were at, but we don't know which sizes were where. And some of that we've had to guess. Um, but it would be likely that six pounders would be grouped with six pounders. Three pounders would be with three pounders because you're sharing implements and powder charges and cannonballs. But we know that that 18 pounder, how Colonel Travis used it. Yeah, that, the 18 pounder is the only cannon we know for a fact was on the southwest corner. The Mexican Army talks about that. Cannons obviously played a tremendous role in the siege of the Alamo. Can you describe that? Yeah, so during the siege, the Mexican Army is pounding the Alamo fort. Uh, they're firing what's called solid shot, which is just a solid uh, iron or bronze ball, um, sometimes lead or even rock. And they're firing at the walls to reduce the walls to rubble in, in hopes that it'd make it easier for the infantry to attack when the actual battle begins. And so the Texans are being shelled constantly. And a scare tactic, too. Yeah, it's so a psychological warf warfare. Even though no Texans were killed during the uh, siege, um, it's still something to be thinking that you're sleeping at night and you could get hit by a stray cannonball flying over the walls. Cannot imagine. Yeah, terrifying. Must have been terrifying, yeah. Well, the morning of March 6, 1836, before dawn, the battle begins, and pretty much any weapon you can get your hands on, you are using. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there's a when the Texians capture the town of Bejar in December of 1835 and the Alamo, they capture all of the excess weapons. And so the Texans likely had loaded firearms stacked in a row by their uh, defensive positions. And when the battle begins, they're firing them as rapidly as they could. As far as the cannons, if they could no longer be manned, if it got to the point where they needed to be abandoned, what was done to keep them out of enemy hands? Yeah, if the enemy is approaching and you don't have time to destroy the cannon, um, what normally would happen is they have uh, in their inventory a spike. And a spike could either be one that's inserted into the muzzle to keep you from loading a cannonball in it, or a spike that would go in the touch hole, which is where the ignition system is for the uh, early cannon. And so you'd hammer that in there and you'd run. The battle lasted roughly 90 minutes. Where on Alamo grounds can you see evidence from the battle, like cannon shots or shotgun blasts? Yeah, um, if you look at the facade of the church today, you will see um, there is a mark. Um, so basically, if you're staring at it, there are two empty niches where Catholic saints would have stood. And the lower one, there's kind of a seashell design there. And many believe, myself included, that that might have been a cannonball that struck the church, possibly a six-pounder. Did the Mexican army take weapons from the fallen Alamo defenders with them? And while that sounds like a no-brainer, there's only so much you can carry with you back in those days. Yeah, you know, uh, there are... The, the, the Mexican army wins the Battle of the Alamo, and they have control of 20-plus cannons. And of that, they only take about four of them with them on their return trip back to the interior of Mexico. They're going to be the lighter guns that had functioning carriages. The rest of them are going to be discarded in the defensive ditches around the Alamo. It doesn't take long, as we know, before the Mexican side is defeated at the Battle of San Jacinto, paving the way for the Texas Republic. As the battlefields are cleaned up, what happens to the weapons? I love that question. So... Uh, this is always funny, and I, and I, um, I smile because being an ex-military person, you follow the orders of your commanding officer. And what happens with the garrison here at the Alamo, they get word that Santana is defeated, and he tells them to retreat from the Alamo and throw all of the cannon in the San Antonio River. And the officer who gets that command does not do that. He does not follow the orders of Santana, and he takes them instead. They spike the, uh, some, in some cases, the muzzle and the touch hole. They break off the trunnions that held the cannon to the carriage and the cascabel that would allow you to uh, raise and lower the elevation of the gun. And they threw them in the defensive ditches and buried them. And they told Santana that they had thrown them in the river. It was a little bit of a secret then about where they put them. Yeah, you know, the men on the ground inside the Alamo in May of 1836 knew that they were burying them, but the rest of Mexico wouldn't have had a clue, and neither would the Texians. In the coming decades, as Texas becomes part of the United States, the army takes over, the area becomes much more commercialized. You start seeing people like Samuel Maverick find these cannons buried in their yards. Yeah, what a, what a stupendous find for him. Um, he's out 
the story is that he's out in his yard and his wife wants a new picket fence. So he goes out with a couple of men, they start digging and they uh, strike something hard metallic object in the ground. They uncover, um, I, th I think it's somewhere uh, in the neighborhood of 18 Cannon in his front yard, some bronze and some iron. You spoke about how they never actually put the cannons in the San Antonio River, but that lived on, and people did eventually try to find them at the bottom of the river. What did your research show? Yeah, so um, so that the story goes that all the cannons are dumped, and when they find them there, they thought the Texans had buried them. This is in the 1850s. They thought the Texans had buried them to keep them out of the hands of the Mexican Army. That's what the newspaper writes. What ends up happening is that the cannons are discovered by Samuel Maverick, and it starts this cannon craze, and everyone's wanting to find cannons. And um, at the Battle of Behar, which preceded the Battle of the Alamo, the Mexican Army did shove about anywhere from six to eight cannons into the San Antonio River. Samuel Maverick's sons claimed that they could swim down the river and they could fill them with their hands. Um, they've never been recovered. The San Antonio River has been concrete lined over, and they're still waiting to be discovered. And people have actually used equipment to try to find them? Yeah, they've used different uh, types of equipment, and they've went into the river, and every... I think it's every year they clean the river out. There's always talk about pulling the concrete up and they know roughly where they are and trying to recover those old guns. You like to say these cannons are now silent, but not forgotten. Many are on display right now at the Alamo. Yeah, I, that's a big part of our site interpretation. Uh, these, uh, these artillery pieces that were once used in very violent ways are now being used to tell a greater story at the Alamo. And um, while the Alamo, the Battle of the Alamo is the birth of Texas freedom and the story of our state and very Texas centric. The story is a world story because you've got artillery from all over the world being used by several different national armies and the Texans included. We spoke earlier about the 18 pounder cannon used to send a message to the Mexican army. It's unfortunately been lost to time, but it has quite an interesting backstory in the decades after the battle. Yeah. So the 18 pounder is actually discovered in front of the Alamo. It was one of the larger cannons it was pushed in a nearby ditch and they, these uh, soldiers find it, and the locals tell them, yeah, all the treasure from the Alamo defenders are inside. And so they actually saw on it with rope, uh, acid-soaked rope, and hit it with hammers. And they break the muzzle of the gun off, and they find nothing inside the gun. So it's discarded. And the city says, well, that's a pretty hideous thing laying out in the plaza, and it's in the way. So they put it in a local park, San Pedro Springs Park, on a concrete plinth. And there it sits until about 1917, and it disappears. And we don't know who took it, who has it. We have no idea. Um, we know that it's referenced as an ugly gun many times in the newspaper. And um, we think it may have just been rolled in a nearby ditch and reburied. Or uh, some people think maybe a scrap drive in World War I. Um, and, and then there's another theory that I think might hold some water. is that a local blacksmith took it onto his property and the family might still have it to this day. Wow. Yeah. So more research to be done. What happened to the come and take it cannon after all? So the come and take a cannon ends up at the Alamo. It's the bronze large gun uh, that the uh, Texians had. That cannon is found on the Maverick property when he's building that fence. And I believe it's after his death, his wife, um, Mary Maverick, actually donates it to their church, uh, St. Mark's Episcopal. And the church needed a bell, so they took this cannon, they sent it up to Neely, New York, to a foundry. They melted it down, and they made a bell, and it still hangs in their bell tower today. So you can come see it right here in downtown San Antonio. You can come see it, but you can't come and take it. You've been instrumental in making sure the historic cannons at the Alamo get restored. You've worked with experts at Texas A&M, and this is a painstaking process. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it started off as a very small project and a kind of a joke between myself and Ernesto Rodriguez, the other historian on site. And they were trying, the staff at the Alamo was trying to determine how we can get people to engage the plaza and realize the Alamo is much larger than just two buildings. And we jokingly said we should recreate the cannon. And that sparked off a whole bunch of uh, different projects. And uh, we've used a lot of the Alamo guns that are currently on display to make patterns and make functioning uh, replicas, which has been a lot of fun. And we've been able to shoot them. And yeah, it's just great. And who is the team at Texas A&M you're working with? So there is a conservation research laboratory at Texas A&M. Um, Chris Dostal is in charge of that at the moment. And they not only took in all the Alamo cannons and did analysis on them, um, they disarmed some of them. Some of them had powder charges and balls in them still. And they did all this work and preserved this huge piece of Texas history. They did it at no cost. And this has to be said, you know, in a world we live in today where dollar kind of rules the world, they did it for free because they're lovers of Texas history. 
And you did say a second ago you like to fire the cannons. Where do you fire them? Yeah, so we, we've we been um, shooting cannons here at the Alamo for a couple of years. A bunch of us went and got trained um, and went through a, a pretty in, uh, intense training uh, course. And we go shoot them um, at different places. We just went to Shriner University and fired one off for a 1,000 school-aged children. Um, you can talk about cannon all day, and you can stand next to a replica, but to hear one fire is is absolutely insane, and it's just so it's fun. Have to ask the first time you fired a cannon. Describe that feeling. It, it, being a military person, I thought I'd seen everything uh, loud and big, and we fired one off for the History Channel three years ago, and when we fired that, it completely shocked all of us. I'd never felt anything like that before, and we fired live rounds out of it, which is does it ever get old? No, not ever. And if it does, then I need to retire because... Well, we don't want you to retire. We want you to stick around for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Now, circling back to the start of the conversation, these were ordinary people using the weapons they had through circumstance to defend their side. What can we learn from that? Um, we can learn that we shouldn't draw such rigid, distinct lines between people that lived in 1836. Um, the Mexican army is full of people who had families. They had friends living here. The people living in Texas, in San Antonio, or Bihar, as it was called back then, they went to market together, they ranched together, they shared their lives, they went to church with one another, and the revolution came to them, and they were forced to make a decision. In some cases, you were staring at your friend across a battlefield, and I, I just think we need to be careful about drawing these distinct lines between people we, we never met. Well, that's a great note to end on. Colby yeah. Lanham, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. If you are interested in learning more about artillery, check out the podcast notes. We've linked to research on the Alamo's website about the 18-pounder cannon. We've also linked to more information about the restoration process through Texas A&M. You've been listening to Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. <laughs>